So welcome. I'm really excited that you're here. My name is Carrie Wickstead and I work with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources for our Wildlife and Heritage Service. So in the overall umbrella of the department, we manage the state's wildlife resources, the ducks and the bucks and everything else in between, including the native butterfly species. And we're primarily funded through hunting license fees and excise taxes on firearms. So I'm coming to you today via our Wild Acres program. If you're not familiar with the program, it's all about backyard wildlife habitat. And normally I would do these types of talks and presentations for communities and different groups across the state, but we're all doing everything virtually now. So, uh, so this is part of a series, uh, Gardening for Pollinators. Next week is National Pollinator Week, and we have a whole lineup of different talks. So if you enjoyed this one, I highly encourage you to, to sign up for some of our talks next week. We'll feature things like wasps and flies and bumblebees, and we'll have a few family-friendly friend presentations as well. One of the first things that I asked in the, uh, the registration was, who pollinates? When you think of pollinators, what, what do you think of? And the words that are the largest here on the screen, the bats, the bees, and the butterflies, are the ones that came up the most often with people's different responses. And as you look a little closer, there are a few other things that people thought about, like wind and flies and wasps. And we do have an assortment of pollinators. So here in Maryland, uh, our only pollinator with a backbone uh, are the ruby-throated hummingbirds. So they're the only hummingbird that breeds in Maryland, even though we have a few others that stop by occasionally. And certainly in tropical areas, bats are also important pollinators, but we don't have any bats that pollinate here in Maryland. Our most important group of pollinators are bees. We have over 430 species of bees, which is a tremendous amount of biodiversity or bee diversity there. And bees are our best pollinators because they're super hairy. So look at that hairy body right there. And when they fly through that, uh, fly through the air, it creates an electrical charge that actually causes pollen to stick to their body. So it makes them really nice and efficient at moving pollen around. And, and I forgot to mention, pollination is, is moving pollen from one plant to another. So uh, there are a variety of plants that rely on animal pollinators to do it. Some of the plants can do it themselves and others rely on wind and or water to help with that moving, pollen, pollen moving. So flies also help pollinate. And one of our talks next week by my coworker, Paula Becker, will be, all be about fly pollination. And one of our bigger groups of fly pollinators here in Maryland are flower flies or cyprid flies, also known as hoverflies. And this is a photo I took from my own garden. This is one of those flower flies. They, uh, they do double duty. They pollinate as adults and they're juveniles. The maggots actually eat other insects. So, and particularly things like, like aphids. So they're really good at having in the garden because they're pollinators and predators. We do have a number of moths that also help to pollinate. Some of our larger moth species like the luna moths actually don't eat at as adults, but some of the smaller species do and they do move pollen around. So they primarily go after things that are blooming at night. Then we have our wasp and a selection of our wasp actually is help with pollination. And this is a photo from a local photographer Pauline Horn. This is a yellow jacket on burr cucumber, a native type of cucumber that you can find. And uh, they eat pollen and nectar as adults. And much like the flies, their juveniles are carnivorous. So they eat other organisms. So they also do those double duties in the garden. And certainly there are other things like ants and beetles that also assist with pollination in our area. But they don't do a lot of it, mainly because they don't have a lot of those hairs to pick up that pollen and move it around. So <clears throat> if you look at different flowers, sometimes you can determine who's supposed to be the main pollinator based on things like the color or the smell or the shape of that flower and uh, when it produces nectar. So as you can see, bats go after things that are white and fruity and bloom at night. Uh, so if you're in tropical areas like down in Texas and in Central and South America, you might see some bat pollinators. We can thank them for different types of fruits and, and other things like agave. Uh, and agave is where we get tequila from. So next time you have a margarita, raise a glass for the bats. You can give them thanks for that. But all of our bats here in Maryland are insectivores. So they're out there eating the beetles and the mosquitoes and the moths and stuff like that at night. 
You can look at things that are fly pollinated. A lot of them uh, resemble dead stuff. So dark purple or brown and stinky. And sometimes they bloom during the day or sometimes at night. So pawpaws, if you're familiar with pawpaws, those are fly pollinated species. And also some um, night flying moths assist with that as well. And then those flowers that don't need animal pollinators, they don't put any energy into big showy flowers or, or showy scents um, or anything like that. So they usually have those dull green, brown, tiny flowers, and they're essentially, they're dumping all their energy into creating as much pollen as possible. And when they throw it all out in the air, uh, that's what gets lodged in our sinuses and causes a lot of our seasonal allergies. So here are two plants that are great pollinator plants here in Maryland. We've got bee balm, the red colored flower there on the left-hand side of the screen, and goldenrod. And this is actually showy goldenrod, one of our biggest goldenrod species here in Maryland. When you look at bee balm and look at that color, uh, that bright red color in those tubular flowers, who do you think pollinates it? Why don't you type it in into the chat? Who do you think is the primary pollinator of bee balm? Just based on the color and the shape of those flowers. I see some bees and hummingbirds, bees, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, yeah, lots of votes for hummingbirds, good. So this is, this is a great uh, hummingbird plant. Hummingbirds in our area are attracted to flowers that are red or orange and tubular. So uh, this nice flower tube is perfect for a hummingbird's tongue to get down into to, to get to that nectar. And then on the top here, they have, um, they have parts that actually help put the pollen on that, that hummingbird so the hummingbird can help move the pollen around in addition to drinking that nectar. Now if we look at something like goldenrod, with these big yellow showy flowers, who do you think might be the primary pollinator that goldenrod's trying to attract? Those big yellow flowers. Got some nice landing platforms on them. See butterflies, bees, bees. Bees are butterflies. Bees, bees. Yeah, good job. You guys already know all this stuff. I don't have to be here today. <laughs> so goldenrod is pollinated by a lot of different things, but bees are one of the primary uh, groups that, that this species attracts. And goldenrod is often perceived as an allergen, so especially the, the fall blooming goldenrod, people start having fall allergies and see all the goldenrod blooming around and they think, oh, I got to get rid of the goldenrod. But it's not the goldenrod that's causing those seasonal allergies. It's things like ragweed that we don't really notice because of those nondescript flowers that's causing all the problems. So when I teach insect classes, I specifically try to find goldenrod patches because you just see a diversity of, of insects visiting goldenrod. And our late season goldenrods are great sources of nectar for things like monarch butterflies when they're doing their, their southward migration. So now we're going to get into just some pollinators and start with our bees. I know there was a lot of interest on um, different types of bees here in Maryland, and we'll have a talk on Maryland's bumblebees next week. So our bees can be split into two main groups, those that are solitary and those that are social. Solitary bees uh, are the majority of our bee species worldwide and here in Maryland. And essentially when they mean by it, what they mean by solitary is that you have a single female that is creating the nest for her young and her young alone. So she's just taking care of just her babies. She's making a single nest and she has to create that nest, provision it with food and lay the eggs in her very short life cycle. In contrast, social species like, um, which we only have a handful of social bees here in Maryland. Those include a lot of our bumblebees and the non-native honeybees. They form colonies. So there's a queen that forms the colony and she has division of labor. So some people are supposed to take care of the nest, others are to forage, and others are out there to defend the nest. As you can imagine, those social bee species and social wasp species are the ones that tend to be more aggressive when you get closer to that colony because you, they, they are trying to protect the rest of their, their family. Whereas those solitary bees and the solitary wasps I always joke, they don't got any time to sting you because they have very short life cycles. They have to do everything on their own. They really won't attack unless they feel significantly threatened. And a lot of our solitary bee species, their stingers are smooth and, and not able to penetrate human skin. So, um, so it's, uh, it's a little different territory there. 
So in the world of our solitary bees, we have bees that nest in the ground and bees that nest in tubes and tunnels. The majority of our bee species nests in the ground, and one of those include the spring beauty bee. As its name suggests, its primary plant that it pollinates is spring beauty, which is one of those early spring blooming wildflowers that we have on the forest floor. It's always my sign of spring when I finally see it out and about as I'm hiking around. The spring beauty bee is what's considered to be a specialist. And that is, uh, that means that it only visits spring beauty. And we have about 20% of our bee species are, are um, these specialists that have special relationships with either individual species or flowers or just a handful of species of flowers. So it's a very fragile relationship. The loss of the spring beauty can cause the loss of the bee or vice versa. The spring beauty bee also has one of the best work schedules ever. It uh, only works about 10, 30 in the, 10 in the morning until 2.30 in the afternoon when it's the warmest outside and those flowers are most likely to be open and producing pollen and nectar. On rainy days, it doesn't actually come out at all. And if it's too cold, it will also stay down in the ground. <laughs> so it's a great work schedule to me. But it's all optimized based on, on foraging. So early in the morning in the spring, it's too cold for a lot of those flowers to be producing nectar. Um, some of them aren't even open. And uh, it's too cold for that bee to justify flying around trying to find food when it's going to spend too much energy keeping itself warm. So I see a question from Judith, what do solitary bees use their stingers for? They use their stingers for defense, but uh, we are not a main predator of solitary bees. They often have to defend themselves against other, um, their, their types of, of parasitic bees, cuckoo bees, and their parasitic wasp and, and things like that that they have to defend themselves against. These large beetles known as um, American oil beetles are predators of some ground nesting bees. So they have to defend themselves against that as well. And interestingly enough, solitary bee venom is very different from social bee venom as well. So even if they were to sting you, you're not going to have the same reaction because they don't have anybody else in the colony to call, call up. And, and again, we're not the primary targets that they have to defend themselves against. Whereas something like a honeybee colony has got a lot of fat and protein in it and it's all dipped in honey. So large mammals like ourselves and bears and raccoons and things like that are primary predators of those honeybee colonies and they had to evolve a defense system against us from eating them. So hopefully that helps clear up that information there. Another specialist bee that we have and one that you might see out and about in your gardens very soon is the squash bee. This bee, uh, as its name suggests, it pollinates everything in the squash or cucumber family. So they include squashes and cantaloupes and pumpkins and melons and all of that. They often nest in the ground very close to wherever the gar your gardeners are. So if you overtill the ground or put a lot of insecticides down in the ground, you might inadvertently kill some of your squash bees that are nesting there. Sometimes early in the morning when the squash flowers are all closed up, you can gently open them up and you'll see the males snoozing inside. They'll often sleep inside those squash flowers overnight. And sometimes the females will join them too. Final group of bees that I wanna talk about, and this is a whole group instead of a, just an individual species, are the leaf cutter bees. And they are also active this time of year. So you might see, if you've got any legume plants, you might see these little discs that are cut out of, of leaves and everything. And those discs are actually being cut by these tiny little bees. They um, wrap them up and they stuff them down into tubes and they make their, their nests out of tubes and tunnels. So unlike carpenter bees, they can't chew their own tunnels. So they rely on tunnels that have been built by others, like built by bees or holes, or beetles, sorry, or holes in, in trees and things like that, or even hollow flower stems. Unfortunately, despite their importance to us in terms of, of pollinating a lot of food crops that we depend upon, and also their importance to other organisms that eat them, pollinators around the world have been declining over the last 10 years. And you can see from this graph that butterflies, beetles, and bees are some of the hardest hit with very, very large declines. Almost half of the population has declined globally. So this is a worldwide issue. And one of the major reasons for declines is habitat loss or degradation of those habitats. 
But the beautiful thing about pollinators is that we can actually create habitat in very small spaces like our backyards or on our decks and things like that. And we can really have a huge impact by creating that habitat for those species. So the recipe for success with pollinators is to plant native species. These things that co-evolved with our local pollinators. You should plant um, species that are going to provide things like nectar and pollen. In addition, nest and nursery sites, which I'll talk about towards the end of this presentation. Another thing to think about is removing invasive species. Invasive species are non-native species that cause problems. One example is butterfly bush, a species that's just starting to expand here in Maryland. It's a species that's native to Asia. It's really, really attractive to butterflies because it releases floral scents that gets them all excited. So they come and visit those butterfly bush flowers. But what's important to know is that attracting isn't the same as supporting. Even though those flower scents of butterfly bush are bringing those butterflies in, some of the research of the nectar content of butterfly bush in its natural area, like in, in China and places like that, I found that it's not optimal in terms of, of sugar concentrations, and it lacks a lot of necessary nutrients that are needed for reproduction of those butterflies. In addition, butterfly bush doesn't support any of our native butterfly species in terms of that host habitat or where they lay their, their eggs and their caterpillars feed upon. So my coworker Paula says that butterfly bush is a lot like putting a Coke machine in a high school. Of course, the kids are going to flock to those sugary drinks, but it's not actually supporting their growth and their development. Just something to keep in mind. Another thing to help with pollinators besides just planting native species is creating and enhancing that habitat. And I'll go over more of these principles at the end of the presentation, but one thing that you can do for a lot of different species, including species like our luna moths, are to leave the leaves in the fall. So, I think I missed. <clears throat> Before I get into designing pollinator habitat, does anybody have any questions? Um, so is there something to plant that is like butterfly bush that you can suggest to neighbors? That's a good question. And it's hard because nothing brings, nothing that's native brings in butterflies quite like butterfly bush. Um, so it's, it's difficult to suggest an alternative, but we do have some good plants. If you're down on the coastal plain, uh, sweet pepper bush is a really, really great plant. It doesn't bloom very long. It will be blooming very soon, but it is a butterfly magnet. Another great one is uh, sweet joe pieweed. So I'll talk about this a little bit later, but pieweed is another butterfly magnet plant that, that's easy to grow and it really, really brings a lot in. And both pieweed and, and sweet pepper bush are host plants, so they're going to support the, the juvenile life cycle of the uh, butterflies as well. So, all right, any other questions? If anybody has any other questions, you can type them down in the chat. I'll be looking at that and uh, everything. Hybrids of native plants. Good question. I will get to hybrids in a sec. So, and what about milkweed? Milkweed is a great plant to put out there for monarch butterflies, and about 12 other species also use milkweed to host on. So. And I'll go through some, some different types of nectar plants, as well as a few host plants as well. Okay, well, I'll move on, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. So one of the things about designing habitat, the first step is to know your habitat. And this might seem really rudimentary, but I get a lot of people who email me and they were like, I want to help butterflies. What do I plant? And then I have to ask them, well, I need to know things about how big is your area that you're planting? How much sun does it get? What's your soil like? So, uh, so think about uh, the pH of the soil. Is it sand? Is it clay? Is it loam? and uh, what type of nutrients are in the soil, and, and the climate, essentially, where, you're, where are you found in Maryland? All of those things really, really matter what's going to do well in your habitat. It's also important to know your goals. So uh, are you uh, only trying to plant and attract a particular species like monarchs, or do you want to have a pollinator party and have everybody come and visit? Or you have, do you have broader goals besides just pollinators? You want to support all sorts of other different species as well. 
So these are things to think about, and this will help you with planning out your garden and essentially where you want to go. And this picture is my garden from about a couple years ago, so that solid wall of periwinkle is, is almost gone. So this is something to consider. Take it in pieces and parts and, and do it, you know, at little pieces so you're doing it well instead of trying to do it all at once and, um, and having some issues along the way. Ooh, a little far. So location really, really matters. And one example is um, it, this, this is the physiographic provinces in Maryland. And, and this map, if you haven't seen it before, it's based on underlying geology of different areas of Maryland and then just kind of like the basic climate of, of those different areas. So I live down here on the coastal plain and uh, here in Anne Arundel County. And so it's warmer down here than the rest of the state. We are in full blown summer right now compared to my coworkers that are out in Western Maryland and the Allegheny Mountain region. They, uh, they had snow like a month ago. So they're really behind with in terms of, of spring blooms and all of that. And their soils are very, very different. Certainly there are plants that can grow all across the state, but some plants might be restricted just to the coastal plain or to the mountain region. So it's important to know that about the plants before you select them and put them in your gardens. A really good guide to help you with all of that is this U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service guide, and I'll send you the link to it at following this presentation. And it will tell you the different regions of Maryland and also the different types of habitat these plants grow within. There's also this nativeplantcenter.net website, which is based off of this guide. And instead of going through the guide, you can actually click the little boxes that say in terms of, of um, your sun, your soil, your location, what type of plant that you want, a shrub or a herbaceous plant, you want an emergent plant for a pond, and it will tell you different types of plants to, to use. So, uh, so this is a really, really helpful site, um, site for you. So I, I see a couple questions. Um, just remember milkweed can become invasive if you aren't careful. So milkweed certainly, and common milkweed can become very aggressive if you have the good habitat for it. I wouldn't consider it to be invasive because the federal definition of invasive species is a non-native species uh, that causes problems. So, uh, so native species that, that can be a little, uh, little pushy, I call them aggressive. And, uh, and milkweed certainly can be that way. So if you have a small space, milkweed might not be a good option for you, at least that common milkweed, something like butterfly weed, which is the orange version of milkweed, that's a little less aggressive with its spread and its growth. So I also see a question, could we use butterfly bush to draw in butterflies but plant it near native plants? It's certainly possible, but my concern would be that the butterfly bush is going to be spreading outside your zone. So it's, it has wind dispersed seeds and it can spread pretty long distances. So, so that's my concern is that it would be moving outside your yard and colonizing natural areas, which is what we're seeing in certain portions of the state. Good questions and keep them coming. So uh, another site that I like to tell people to look at when selecting plants for your region is the Maryland Biodiversity Project. So these are one of our partners and they have this great website if you haven't been to it yet. And you can type in the names of different species, not just plants, and you can see their distributions across Maryland and you can contribute content to it. So it's all generated by people's, uh, people's data and sightings that they have. So this plant that I'm showing you here is Golden Alexanders, and I just added this to my garden this year. I'm really excited, and the reason that I added it is because it's a host plant for black swallowtails, pictured off to the side. So, uh, so I added this in, and it likes shade, and it likes moist soils, which I have out front. But uh, if I was down on the lower shore, this wouldn't be a very good plant for me to select. It might grow down in like Somerset County and places like that, but it probably won't do well. And, um, and so this is important to know is, is where these plants are found growing across the state and where they would be naturally growing. They might grow well outside of those areas, but sometimes they get stressed. And I find that when plants are stressed, they're a lot more susceptible to pests and diseases. So if you're planting things in the right spot, it's going to increase your success that that plant's going to work. 
and also decrease your likelihood of having to deal with those issues, those secondary issues, because the plant's unhappy. So a few other things to consider, and, and this is from my experience. Starting small is really, really important. When I first moved in with my husband and I had my first yard, I was like, oh, I'm going to take over everything. And I was trying to do too much too fast. And I had a lot of failures at that time. You might select plants that sound great for your habitat in terms of the sun, the soil, and, and everything like that. And then all of a sudden, it just fails. So there are certain things in your soils that make it unique. And so it might not be a good habitat for that plant in your area. And we're also dealing with different pressures in our yard. So I have deer pressure and I also have groundhog pressure. So I have to select plants that are going to, to be able to withstand those issues in my yard. I usually suggest uh, maybe planting just a handful, like one or two native plants uh, of a particular species in your yard and seeing how it works for the first year. See how it spreads, see how well it grows, see any problems that you might have with it before you invest more money in, in a larger group of them. Because you do want to plant these in clumps. You don't want to plant individual plants out there. That's not enticing if you're trying to feed a hungry pollinator or a hungry, hungry caterpillar. They need a lot of plants to be able to eat. And they need them in a clump together because it takes a lot of energy to fly from plant to plant. So if you've got one plant over here and one way over there, they're going to be spending a lot of energy going back and forth between. So that's just something to consider. Another thing to consider is to vary the bloom times. So having, if you really want to support a diversity of pollinators, have stuff that blooms in early spring, in midsummer, and then late fall. And actually, spring and late fall are two of the most limiting times for a lot of our pollinators. So putting things out there, really, really important. And they don't have to be all of these things in the same garden. So out front, I have a lot of shade, and a lot of my spring bloom blooming plants are out front. Whereas out back, I have a lot of sun. So I put out my summer and fall blooming plants out in the back. So it's supporting, my, my habitat's still supporting a variety of pollinators, it's just different sections of my yard are supporting them at different times of the year. And this is where we come in with the cultivars and, and the hybrids. So this is something, and this is evolving research. So I don't have all the answers just yet, and nobody really does, because it's just starting to come up as a question. So cultivars are plants that are bred for human characteristics. Either it, it has bigger, showier flowers, it um, is more susceptible to different habitats like drier conditions, it's less susceptible to diseases like powdery mildew. It's bred for something that, that humans want, okay? Um, not necessarily something that animals want or need. So a good example of this is cardinal flower, and this comes from Dr. Annie White's research from the University of Vermont. So cardinal flower is a great plant. As you look at it, you can probably uh, guess that it is something that is pollinated by hummingbirds, but it's a little finicky to grow. Uh, it needs wet soils, it likes full sun, and uh, it can be hard to, to get into seed and everything. So this is a cultivar, and this is, uh, this is a cross, actually, between cardinal flower and great blue lobelia. It has a lot more flowers to it. It's a lot more robust with its growth pattern and, and less picky about where it likes to live. So in it, Dr. White's research, she found that a lot of hummingbirds, more hummingbirds were visiting this, this cultivar than the straight species. However, when she looked at the nectar content, the cultivar had 80% less nectar than the straight species. And this goes back to that uh, attracting isn't the same as supporting. So it's just something to consider. Just because you're seeing these organisms visit it does not mean that they're getting all of the, their needs, the pollen and that nectar, that food and that fuel that's really going to help them out. Now this is very different based on cultivars. There's some cultivars that perform better than the straight species and some that perform less. So Mount Cuba is doing a lot of research and I'll link you to, uh, to some, one of the articles that I wrote about cultivars that has some additional research and everything. But what I'm finding right now is a lot of this research is just focused on the number of animal visits, not the nectar and the pollen content, which is really going to be the defining factor of is if it's actually helping these species or not. So just some things to, to think about. Okay, 
So I see some questions um, that uh, butterfly bush, neighbor has butterfly bush and has to deal with seedlings everywhere. Yes, I, I've seen that a lot. And <laughs> I live in a neighborhood that has a lot of invasive plants. So I'm out there always weeding. So I feel your pain. And, uh, and hopefully you can find a way to talk with your neighbor, maybe suggest some alternatives that they might be able to use. And I see somebody has raised their hand. Does anybody have an additional question? Any questions? I have a question about, can you hear me? Yes. I have a question about, in the fall, I noticed that some of my plants had attracted a lot of bees. The bees didn't seem to have any pollen on their legs, though. I mean, was that because it's mostly males in the fall, or is it, or is it that they've stopped getting pollen and they're just coming for nectar? These were hyssop plants. It, it depends. Um, in the fall, a lot of the colonies are, are winding down for, for the bumblebees and things like that. So the males are going out and mating and dying. So it could be the males are just eating that nectar and uh, not collecting the pollen because they really don't have anybody to feed at that point. But the plant itself is, is okay, the hyssop plant for bumblebees. Hyssop plants are fine, yes. Yeah, I see, I think anise hyssop is something that um, is supposed to attract a lot of pollinators. I don't know about pollen and nectar content, but I know it's a highly attractive plant. Oh, I see a question about which plants would be good for tiger swallowtails. So perfect question for, uh, for this, this next slide here. So when we think about planting for things like butterflies, uh, a good example of, of planting for them is, is planting for the life cycle. So supporting not just the adults and what they're going to feed on, but also the juveniles, those caterpillars and what they're going to feed on. And those caterpillar plants are what we call host plants. So here are some of our showier butterfly species, the ones that a lot of people like to attract because they like to see. And this is just a selection of some of their host plants that you can see here. So that black swallowtail, um, dill, farce, parsley, fennel, and rue are all non-native herbs that you can put in pots and attract those swallowtails. I attract swallowtail, black swallowtails with my parsley every year, but I've just switched to putting out those golden alexanders this year and I'm going to judge how well it does. And uh, the Eastern tiger swallowtails, they like to lay their eggs on a lot of things. So magnolias and willows and cherry trees are all loved by Eastern tiger swallowtails. And one great resource that we have online that you might not be aware of is our butterfly checklist. It lists the majority of the butterfly species here in Maryland, where they're located, and the plants that they visit by adults, and then also what they feed on as juveniles. And I will send you a link to this research. So uh, at the end, you can go and download this. I think it's like a seven page document and it has over 150 butterflies documented on it. So, and it's all specific to Maryland. It was put together by Maryland lepidopterists. And uh, I see a question about suggestions for native plants to substitute butterfly bush. Seems like that's a big question, so I'll um, add that as a resource to, uh, to the, the materials that I send out to everybody. And when would you see, um, so it's the zebra swallowtails that use pawpaw trees, and this time of year, they're out there on those pawpaw trees. I think I've already seen some caterpillars posted online, so you might see them out and about already. And uh, I see them a lot of times early spring, the adults over winter, and I think it's chrysalises. And, uh, and so they come out early spring and, and lay their eggs on those pawpaws pretty early. Good questions. So here's just some other research about woody plant hosts. Um, these are the plants that are, you know, plants that have trees and shrubs, essentially woody, woody tissue. And this is from Dr. Doug Tallamy, who's over at University of Delaware. You might be familiar with his research and some of his books like Bringing Nature Home and things like that. So these are just the top five native plants, um, the top not five native woody species, and then the top five non-native woody species. And just to give you a contrast, the, the number one species are oaks that support over 530 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. Whereas pears, like Bradford pears, only support 138. I mean, that's a lot, but that's about 20% of what an oak would support in terms of diversity. 
And certainly as you go down the list, it drops down really fast, whereas these plants are, are still pretty high. Now one thing to note, if you're planting these things out there for butterflies, they're going to be eaten. So things like cherries, everybody loves to eat cherry trees. It always gets uh, things like eastern tent caterpillars, which are native, and uh, other types of, of caterpillar outbreaks that really defoliate those trees, okay? So if you're not okay with that, don't plant them in your front yard and make them a focal species in your garden or something like that because they're essentially being out there, they're, they're, they're being, so back up, they serve as something to be eaten. So keep that in mind. I have black cherries in my backyard, but they're on the sides of the yard, so they're not something that people focus upon. When the tent caterpillars break out, then I've got the cardinals, uh, the, uh, sorry, the orioles, and the cuckoos that come in and unzip those tents and feed off of those, those caterpillars. So it's supporting the life cycles in, in my yard. And I see the question about the hyssop is not native to Maryland. It's true, it's not native. And just because something isn't native doesn't mean that it's not something you can plant. Um, a lot of our non-native plants are easy to find and easy to grow in pots. So if you have those limitations, sometimes um, making that concession on a non-native plant that's not invasive is something to do. So Orioles, yes, I see Orioles every now and again. They just pass through my yard, so they, uh, they don't stick, stick around and breed but they are very much declining here in Maryland and with climate change, um, uh, climate change models, if we continue, Maryland might not be a very good habitat for Orioles to breed in in the future. So, uh, so it is an, an issue there. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into different nectar plants based on the season, starting with spring nectar plants. And uh, so most of these plants are already done flowering for right now. Common blue violet is something that a lot of people just uh, write off. It's something that I wrote off uh, when I first started gardening. It grew wild in my backyard and I just didn't think much of it. But it actually supports fritillary butterflies. It's the host plant for the fritillaries and uh, it also supports a specialist bee that only goes to violet plants. So uh, it's great ground cover. It can be very aggressive and spread very, very well. It's easy to transplant and it grows well in full shade and full sun, so it's an excellent plant for a lot of different habitats. And I always complain that the, uh, the fritillary adults are like ninjas. I never see them, but I find the chrysalis and the caterpillars in my yard. And this year, just like two weeks ago, I saw my first fritillary in the yard hanging out on some of my violets. I was so excited, and I, I have to thank being at home to, I think, finally see that sight. Another good, uh, good ground cover plant is golden ragwort. So this is a semi-evergreen in some areas. In, in my spot in, in Anne Arundel County, mine dies back every year. But it can be a really aggressive plant for growth and spread. And uh, Nancy Lawson with the Humane Gardener, she says that this might be a really good plant to help out compete garlic mustard in certain areas. So, uh, so it's something to consider for that has wonderful flowers that bring in a lot of the, the bees and also some of our beneficial wasps that like to use golden ragwort as well. And I've seen some leaf miners use it too, like leaf miner moths. Wild geranium is a little more dainty and it doesn't spread quite as aggressively, but it has these pretty purple flowers in the springtime. And I see a lot of metallic sweat bees that visit wild geranium, as well as those, those hoverflies that visit it in the spring. And then certainly our columbine is a good shade plant that also attracts hummingbirds. And so uh, one note about columbine and one thing that I learned the hard way, there are a lot of different colors of columbine on the market. Our native one, um, the columbine, which is the um, Aquilegia canadensis, is this, this color right here, the red and the yellow. That's the one that's going to attract the hummingbirds. The ones that I've, I bought by accident, the white ones and the purple ones, don't attract the hummingbirds in because those colors are the cues that, that's bringing those certain species in. So there are leaf miners that love columbines. You'll see lots of squiggles there in the leaves, but things like sparrows like to pick out those leaf miners and feed upon them, and they're mainly just a cosmetic problem. Uh, so it's not really something you have to worry about in your garden. A few other spring nectar plants, because spring is so important for a number of species with pollen and nectar resources. 
the earliest nectar and pollen resource for our local plant species is red maple, at least the earliest native plant that we have. This is a very important food source for a number of our early bees that emerge in the springtime. And this is a plant that can grow throughout Maryland in a variety of habitats. In addition, black willow supports a number of specialist bees. So it's great pollen resource for a lot of those bee species that emerge in the springtime. But a note about black willow and some of its cousins is that they like water very, very much. So you don't want to plant them anywhere close to your house or some of your pipes. And they sucker a lot. So they spread, you know, horizontally and things like that. So, uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind if you are going to plant that. Give it some space and don't put it close to the house. In terms of other plants, we have a whole group of uh, shrubs and small trees known as viburnums. And there's a viburnum out there for you, whether you have sunny habitat or shaded, wet or dry habitat. One of my favorite viburnums is maple leaf viburnum, this plant right here. Only gets about three and a half feet tall. It's our shortest viburnum that we have. It can be a little difficult to find in the nursery trade. It likes shaded areas, but one unfortunate thing about it is that it um, deer love uh, love maple leaf viburnum, where they usually leave most of our other species of viburnum alone. So this is a plant that I just added to my yard, and I thought I was doing all right, but a couple weeks ago the deer hit my viburnum, so I had to put a cage around it. The viburnums all produce these beautiful clusters of white flowers in the spring that are attractive to a lot of our solitary bee species. They often have sweet smells as well. And then in the fall and the winter, they produce these berries that bring in a lot of our birds. And they actually have, their berries have really good fat content that's important for migration of some bird species. So it helps them throughout the year. Two things to note about viburnums. One is that the invasive viburnum leaf beetle has been accidentally introduced to Maryland. It's a problem out in Garrett and Allegheny County and in parts of Baltimore County, and it can cause severe defoliation and sometimes death of those species. So if you plant, want to plant viburnums out there, you can reconsider it if you're in those areas, unless you're willing to monitor that plant and do the work to, uh, to get rid of that viburnum leaf beetle. The other thing to know about viburnums is there's a number of non-native viburnums like double file that are out on the market that are invasive and really spreading here in Maryland. So please try to avoid those and try to use ones that are native to the state. We've got a handful of those species and again we have a lot of them that are, are um, good for a variety of habitats. This plant right here is cherry leaf viburnum. This is one of our taller viburnums. It turns into a small tree. And I really think that this one's an underrated species in landscapes because it is pretty gorgeous. Moving along to some summer plants. Um, all these plants on this slide are in the mint family. So uh, just some things to keep in mind with mints, including our wild mints. They're good at spreading. So all of these plants uh, like full sun and, and they're going to spread on their own. So the bee bombs and the bergamots are pretty easy to pull up. They have shallow root systems. So if they spread beyond your, where you want them to be, they're easy to, to get rid of. But the mountain mint, some of the species of mountain mint can have really tough root systems. So they take a little more elbow grease to get out of the ground. All of these plants bloom right around this time of year. My, uh, my bergamots and mountain mints are just about to pop. So I can't wait because they always bring a lot of pollinators into the yard. As I went over earlier, the bee balm is good for wet soils, and this is a great plant for hummingbirds. And I don't have wet soils, so I have this wild bergamot in my yard. This is from my garden and, and brings in a lot of bumblebees, but it also brings a lot of solitary wasps that are important for pest control. So, uh, so this is a plant to plant out there for pest control, really nice in that regard. Spotted bee balm looks like something out of a Dr. Seuss novel to me, and uh, I just added this plant to my yard this year, so I'm really excited to see some of those flowers develop uh, at this time of year. And this likes really dry soils, dry, sunny areas. It can grow in almost full sand, which is great for some people if you don't have really high quality soil. And then we have our mountain mints. I don't know why I waited so long to add mountain mint to my, my garden, because this thing is a pollinator magnet and it blooms almost continuously from mid-June until September. 
and I have my mountain mint planted right by where I park my car. So I literally just get out and just stare at all the bees, the flies, the wasp, and the butterflies all over this mountain mint. And they're all just happy and buzzing around. And in Penn State pollinator trials, this came out on top in terms of the number of pollinator visits and the diversity of species that were using mountain mint. So, excuse me, it's a really, really nice plant. So um, is there a viburnum that's very smelly native to Maryland? Um, I mean, a lot of our viburnums have soft, sweet scents. I don't know, I wouldn't really call it like a, a really bad smell or a strong smell. So, uh, so I, uh, I don't know of any that might have a really strong scent if that's what you're looking for. Uh, so Robin asks, is mountain mint best grown in a pot because it's invasive? So it's, it's, it's aggressive native, and you can grow them in pots. Uh, so if you don't have an area that you don't want it to spread in, then, uh, then you might just want to plant it in a pot instead of dealing with it. Uh, so something to, to keep in mind. I like to plant these ones that spread because it's a cheaper plant to put out there. You only have to buy a couple, and then they, they spread in and fill in those areas. So <laughs> yeah, aggressive native, good. <laughs> It's okay, I understand, I, I wrestle with that a lot too. So here are some summer nectar plants, and uh, these are some more plants that are gonna be blooming very soon, if not now. My liatris is also just about to bloom, and liatris is great, it's a perennial plant, it comes from a bulb-like root, and it likes the crappiest soils ever. So if you've got nice, like, nutrient-rich soils that are slightly moist, your li liatris isn't gonna work for you. But if you're like me and have straight up clay in your backyard that's super dry and cracked and like really hard to grow stuff in, liatris is for you. This thing naturally grows on roadsides and this plant was actually growing out at uh, Soldier's Delight, which is a serpentine ecosystem. So it likes terrible habitats, has these gorgeous tall purple flowers, they bloom from top to bottom, brings in a lot of solitary wasp like this thread-waisted wasp right here, really good pest control, not aggressive and stingy and uh and if you leave them up then uh, they produce little seeds that the goldfinches love to eat in the fall so it's a really nice plant to put out there and there's several different species that that you can get so sweet pepper bush is uh this is that coastal plain plant and i can't wait till this blooms because it smells so good in my woods and it's always covered in eastern tiger swallowtails and butter but um, bigger butterfly species so the sweet pepper bush and Joe pieweed are two native plants that I often suggest as substitutes for butterfly bush just because of their attractiveness to pollinators. Joe pieweed likes uh, little wetter soils. It often grows along the roadsides in, in wet, um, wet little ditches and things like that. It's really tall, like six to eight feet tall. There's a shorter species that we have here in Maryland, but it's a great butterfly magnet and uh, brings in a lot of pollinators as well. So in my experience, my uh, Joe pieweed hasn't done very well with my local deer, but they don't touch the liatris or the sweet pepper bush. I know a lot of other people who don't have um, issues with pieweed and deer, so it could just be that my deer developed a taste for it. So it's uh, all of our individual experiences and everything. So uh, Jason says he has black haw and full sun and it never blooms. Um, so I don't know why it could be that plant isn't, um, isn't happy. It could be that it's not old enough to bloom. I don't know how old, um, some of the species like, like the maple leaf viburnum only take a couple years to reach maturity to bloom, but I know some of the others like the, uh, the cherry leaf viburnum take a little bit longer. So that could be a, an issue or it could just be an unhappy plant and doesn't want to bloom. I'm sorry. <laughs> And Pamela asked, do I recommend any nurseries for these plants? And I will send you a list of native plant sources. The Maryland Native Plant Society maintains a great list of different native plant nurseries that you can get a lot of these plants from. And a lot of them are doing online um, sales now because they can't do their normal in-person sales as well. Good questions. Okay, last group of, of nectar plants that I'm gonna get into before I get to habitat practices are fall plants. And all of these fall plants are all in the aster family. So, uh, so asters are our largest group of flowering plants and, uh, and they support a lot of species and a lot of them bloom in the fall. So, uh, so bone set 
is a great plant has those tiny little flowers that are attractive to a lot of bees and also flower flies. If you are looking for something for perennial shade in the fall, uh, this white wood aster is a really good plant and it's self seeds so it can aggressively spread in certain areas. But for me, I find a lot, of, it's, it's difficult to find some good perennial shade plants and I've been very happy with the white wood aster in my area. Certainly, there's a number of goldenrods that bring in uh, different species, so it brings in a lot of bees and, and other solitary wasps, like this blue-winged wasp here. Also, the, this species helps eat some stink bugs, just so you know. And uh, one thing to know about goldenrods, there's some that are full sun and full shade, and there's some goldenrods that are super aggressive in gardens and can be hard to, uh, to deal with, and then others that are a little better. So before you put a, a goldenrod out there, do your research and make sure that it's going to fit for your habitat and that uh, if you want it to spread, it's going to be one of those aggressive species. And if you don't want it to spread, it's not. So I have some Canada goldenrod that seeded into my yard on a, its own. So I was like, yay, free plants, really excited. But uh, we have to continually put it in its place and dig up some of those excess rosettes that try to spread outside the garden. I know my husband's probably shaking his head right now because he's often fighting with that Canada gold rod. So, <laughs> but it just, it brings in so much and usually the deer leave the Canada golden rod alone. So, uh, so I, uh, you know, kind of a toss up there. This is a New England aster here. This is a purple plant that blooms up until October. So it's a really nice fall plant. And a lot of these fall asters are providing that fuel for things like monarchs to get south, go south. And some of the research from the coastal Atlantic coast uh, population of, of monarchs has found it's not milkweeds that are the limiting factor, it's these late season nectar sources that's the limiting factor for that population. So having those things that are blooming late in the season and available for nectar are going to give them the fat and reserves to be able to move south. Final group of plants I'm going to talk about, just some things to, to put into pots. So these include some non-native things like pentas, which are really easy to find and easy to grow annuals, dill and fennel and parsley. Those are those plants that uh, provide that nursery habitat for black swallowtails. Purple coneflowers, not native to Maryland, but very easy to grow and, and grow from seeds. So they're really cheap too. And they bring in a lot of bees and butterflies. This is a silver spotted, um, is it silver spotted? Oh, I'm forgetting the, the full name of this, this species here. And, um, and then trumpet honeysuckle is one of my favorite hummingbird plants. This is silver spotted skipper. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. <laughs> so trumpet honeysuckle is my favorite, favorite hummingbird plant. It, it, it's a vine. It grows on a trellis. It's our native honeysuckle. And it's gorgeous. It blooms throughout the, the summer into the fall. And it's a hummingbird feeder I don't have to clean, which is great. Uh, I'm really sad last year with the, the really dry summer and us being away. We weren't able to keep up with watering our trump and honeysuckle. So we lost most of our plant. But we've had it for a very long time. And there's some of it that's trying to come back. One of the biggest things about trump and honeysuckle is just finding a source for it. So, uh, so if you know somebody that has it, you can take some cuttings and use root, root growth hormones and, and get it to root that way. But more nurseries are starting to, uh, to carry it because it is such a popular hummingbird plant. You can also plant things for your own pest control. And I'll send you this list uh, with one of the resources that I'll send out after this. But these are all plants that bring in some of those beneficial wasps, those solitary wasps that also help with eating other insects. So helping to create your own pest control, your own IPM essentially in your gardens. So Stephanie asks, why do I recommend a pot for the native honeysuckle? You don't have to grow it in the pot. I know people that grow it in the ground. Um, it's good to have a trellis or something like that that it can climb up on. It likes, um, it does best in full sun, but it can do part shade. So uh, we just had it in a pot because we inherited it at, in a pot on our deck, and it was just something that uh, we just kept. But if you have limited space, I always suggest it as a pot um, plant for the pot because it blooms for such a long time. And it's a, it's a good one to put out on a deck or porch if you don't have a lot of, of space. So, 
So moving on to some shelter resources, uh, going back to those leaves in the fall, that's nature's blanket and nature's wintering habitat for a number of species. There are a number of butterfly and moth species that overwinter under leaf litter. There are some bats like our eastern red bats that will sometimes, if they stay the winter here in Maryland, they'll overwinter under leaf litter. So a lot of species use those leaves. If you have troubles with, uh, with ticks in the summer, leaf litter can also be tick breeding habitat. So I often suggest removing leaves by mid-May because by that time it's usually warm enough. A lot of those uh, critters have moved on or if you disturb them, it's warm enough that they can kind of figure out a new spot to hang out and live, but then you don't have those issues with ticks. So something to keep, keep in mind with that, uh, with that practice. Wood piles are great for a number of species and uh, there are butterflies like morning cloaks that overwinter in wood piles, but a lot of other wildlife also like wood piles, including our snakes, which I love. I'm giving a snake talk on Saturday if you're interested. But uh, you don't want to put wood piles very close to your foundation because it just can create conflict between some of those species uh, getting into your house and everything. So keep them off to the side, off in the woods and all of that. And that way you have that habitat, but you're not accidentally bringing in some issues for yourself. If you're in areas that have sandy open soil, this is great habitat for a number of our ground nesting bees, particularly our spring ground nesters. So uh, this is an example of a ground nesting bee colony. So all of these holes belong to an individual female bee, and uh, she's only going to care for her, her nest in her hole. They'll aggregate if the habitat's there, but they don't take care of each other at all. In contrast, something that's social like a yellow jacket, they're going to have a single entrance where you're going to see multiple individuals coming in and out. And they also have that bright yellow and black warning coloration letting you know to kind of stay away. So uh, you don't have to worry about ground nesting bees being um, aggressive and stinging you, but you do have to worry about yellow jackets being aggressive if you get too close to their nests. You can build artificial tunnel nests to help a number of species like our, our uh, leaf cutter bees and mason bees are one of the biggest groups that a lot of people like to, to use these for. So there are different types of tubes and tunnels that you can create and this research, much like the research on cultivars, is really starting to evolve. So some of the recommendations that I provided five years ago have changed with newer research. If you're using things like bamboo or if you're using something like these cardboard tubes or paper, one year lifespan for these because uh, they get wet, they can get a buildup of parasites and all of that and you can cause more problems by providing them longer than, than not providing them at all. For things like wood, um, like what I have pictured here, two years maximum for the wood. And when we make these bee houses with our workshops, I purposely put really cheap plywood on top and we use interior hardware on the back because by the time that the plywood is falling apart and the hardware is pretty rusted and gross, it's a good reminder that it's time to change out your box. So these are best to place in south facing areas by early flowering plants. I um, put my mason bee houses up close to my blueberries. So I watch them go back and forth between the blueberries. It's really fun. And the diameter and the length of the tubes is really important. And one of the research articles that I will send you is from Michigan State University about how to design these different types of tubes and uh, nest tunnels and also the, the correct proportions based on, on their research. Certainly, the best thing to do is to create natural tunnel nesting sites. So standing dead trees, which are known as snags, they're not a threat to people, pets, or property. They are the best things for wildlife. They're better than any bee house, bat house, or bird house that you can put up. And when they fall over and start rotting, they also um, provide that, that habitat. So this is uh, one of those sweat bees, metallic sweat bees, using a rotten log as overwintering site. So they also, some of them will also nest in them. Soft woody branches and herbaceous stalks. Uh, so these are just a selection of species. These are all recommended by Heather Holm, Dr. Heather Holm, a uh, native bee researcher. These are things that if you have them in the garden and in the fall, don't take those, those, um, those stalks down. Put, leave them up until late spring and allow those bees to develop inside. And if you have to cut them down early in the spring, and cut them down and set them off to the side instead of throwing them in a compost bin or out in the trash because there might be some developing bees inside. 
So I see a question, uh, do bees go underground? Certain bees, I've seen them go down into a hole. Yes, 70% of our bees nest in the ground. And so very few of our bees uh, with, uh, I think honey or bumblebees are the only group of our native bees that are social bees that nest in the ground. A lot of our other uh, social wasps, we have a number of social wasps like yellow jackets that will nest in the ground too. And a lot of people, when they think of social, uh, bees in the ground, they're, they're always thinking of those wasps because they can be quite aggressive. So another great practice is limiting pesticide and fungicide use in your gardens. And uh, I have this great resource that I'm going to send you. It's very thorough and it has pollinator toxicities to commonly use pesticides in gardens and also for backyard sprays and things like that. It's important to know just because something is organic, it still can be highly toxic to pollinators. So pyrethroids are a great example. They're, um, they're made from plants and they're highly toxic to pollinators. So it's all about making smart choices and only resorting to pesticide or fungicide use when you absolutely have to and have exhausted other options and all of that. If you limit your lawn habitat, lawn is a breeding habitat for things like Japanese beetles and rose chafers, which are common pests in the backyard. Less lawn means less nursery habitat for them. And also encouraging natural predators. So this is a cyphrid fly larvae, one of those flower flies. That's maggot. It's munching on those oleander aphids that you see all over your milkweed plants in the summertime. So, uh, so this is my pest control in my backyard. But it's important to know that some of these guys out in the backyards, like your mantids and stuff like that, they might eat some of the things you like, and it's all part of that circle of life. So keep that in mind. And I will, I'll send you this resource so you can go through. What I like about this resource is it has the trade names and the chemical names. So some of the things are, you know, Roundup is the trade name, but the active chemical is glyphosate. So you can go through that resource and make informed decisions about it. You can also help with a number of research studies. So Monarch Watch is a big program and, and you can get tags from Monarch Watch late in the summer and put them on butterflies to help document their migration. The Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, we don't have any sites in Maryland. So if you wanna do some monarch monitoring in your own backyards, particularly with the caterpillars and all of that, check out that, uh, that site and consider signing up. And there are other resources like Bumblebee Watch, which uh, you can take photos of bumblebees and submit it, and that helps us kind of document bumblebees all around the United States. Another important thing is to educate others. And something that I really suggest with pollinator research is making sure that you're using research, uh, science-based organizations to form your decisions. Organizations like the Xerxes Society, which um, employs a lot of scientists and does a lot of scientific research are really, really important. The Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program is also rooted in a lot of, of research because there are a lot of, of people out there that make claims about what's good for pollinators, but they don't have any scientific backing. So, so always uh, question those sources that you're finding that information from. Here's some great resources, ones that I use to help put this together. I just got this book this year, um, Dr. Heather Holmes' book on bees. This is a wonderful guide. I also have this Bees in Your Backyard. It's a really nice one, but I, I suggest this one over this one because it has all of those plants and everything that they suggest. Um, and it's specific to the Northeast region as well as the Midwest and the Great Lakes. Life Cycles of Butterflies is a great resource looking at 23 common butterfly species in their different stages because they can look very different among the stages. And there are a number of field guides. This is a newer field guide that just came out recently on flowerflies. So if you want to learn more about that group, check out that one. And there again, the Xerxes Society and Dr. Mike Ropp's Bug of the Week page are great resources to look at to learn more about local insects.